and they're going to talk a little bit about the Freedom Trial and where that, uh, where that places us. With a bit of luck. Here we go. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm sure you all know about this trial in some detail, but, so I'll only talk briefly about the, the actual trial results and then discuss it from a cardiology perspective, and you'll be not surprised here. I have a slightly different perspective than the previous speaker, who nonetheless, as usual, gave a very excellent and uh, persuasive talk. So, introduction to the Freedom Trial. Revascularization for patients with multivessel coronary disease is, uh, is obviously very common, and a lot of these patients have diabetes, and the Freedom Trial, following in the footsteps of Bari and Cardia <coughs> and other smaller trials, was designed to look at this and look at the best revascularization approach, and the patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either multivessel stenting, drug-eluting stents, uh, or bypass. And uh, the primary outcome, as you'd expect for a trial of this sort, was all-cause mortality, MI, and stroke. So the patients who were in the study had to have diabetes, two major epicardial vessels with um, angiographically confirmed lesions, and an indication for revascularization based on either symptoms or proven ischemia. There were some fairly standard exclusion criteria for the study, as you would expect, um, and a huge number of patients were screened. Only perhaps 10% of them were eligible, and about 60% of those did consent to the study, so it's a reasonable catchment of the potential population. Um, and they were randomized one-to-one, -one, as I said, to PCI or cabbage. So here's the primary outcome, which you'll have seen a number of times, uh, an early disadvantage to surgery here, and then by the time you get to two years, things are looking pretty equal, and then by the time you get to three years and on, a benefit of surgery over stenting. Uh, some of this is generated by myocardial infarction with a considerably higher degree of uh, myocardial infarction in the drug eluting stent group. Some of it is pure mortality. Again, if you just sort of look at the way the curves tend to go, maybe by three years there's a divergence and by five years it's become just statistically significant. Stroke, uh, as in previous studies, has been more um, popular, if that's the right word, in coronary artery bypass grafting. And of those strokes, a higher proportion were severely disabling. And naturally, that's one of the things that patients are worried about when they go forward for a, a bypass operation. And it's one of the things they're always warned about in terms of risks. Uh, repeat revascularization, no surprise to anyone here that the PCI group does worse, a substantial excess need for repeat revascularization. And in this study, it was largely taxis and cipher stents which were used which, as David has alluded to, are both now obsolete and there are much better stents available um, with much lower rates of revascularization. It's interesting to look at the um, interaction for the primary endpoint with uh, syntax interaction on scoring systems because, perhaps surprisingly, there is no real um, interaction here between syntax score and outcome in the diabetic population in any of these groups. Um, do you have any, any Americans in the house? Not admitting to it anyway. Well, that's a shame, actually, because I was going to say you're rubbish at angioplasty. Um, and that's because um, those of you who know what American practice is, apart from having the perverse financial incentives that we've heard about, which fortunately are, mu are much less significant in this country, they also have a high number of people doing very low volumes. 70% uh, of angioplasty in America is done by people who do 70 or less cases a year. So that's a, a big contrast with um, EU centers. So they contributed quite a lot to the um, PCI results of this study, I would say. So the conclusions of the study itself were that with patients with diabetes and advanced coronary disease, CABG was significant benefit compared to PCI. No significant interaction between the treatment effect of CABG according to syntax scores. Um, and the last 
conclusion was that CAB surgery is the preferred method of revascularization for patients with diabetes and multivessel coronary artery disease. And that one strikes me as slightly surprising because I'm, I'm just wondering when you read that, whose point of view they're saying that from. Is it from the point of view of the surgeon, point of view of the cardiologist, the point of view of the payer, or the point of view of the patient? And I'm just going to sort of elaborate on that theme for a little bit. If we look at the other perspectives around this trial, okay, so first we've got to look at what's the context of the other diabetic data that we have. I mean, this was a very, very good trial, the Freedom Study, uh, unequivocally well run, well organized, you know, the data is very strong and very clear, but there is other diabetic data there which needs to be considered. Then we do have to discuss the stents. I know we're always telling you that we've got a better stent, so it doesn't matter now. The results are much better. And David's point is absolutely right that a bypass, of course, bypasses the whole of the proximal and midsection of the vessel. But if you have better stents which have a lower instance of stent thrombosis and, re and repeat revascularization, that is a major step forward in itself. Then we have the MDT processes, which lead into a short discussion on the patient's point of view and some local factors. So I'm going to deal with each of those for a couple of minutes. The diabetic data that we have is, you know, not comprehensive from other studies, but of interest. And the, in the syntax trial, perhaps surprisingly, um, overall, if you look at the patients with diabetes, you can see my mouse wandering there, you'll see that there's a suggestion that the higher the syntax score, the worse the patients do uh, with, with PCI. But overall, diabetes doesn't seem to influence outcome significantly in this group, which is in contrast to some previous studies. If we look at the CARDIA trial, it wasn't the best trial in the world, but it was done in the UK, and so we should at least pay it some attention. Um, there was actually no difference in the primary endpoint of five years between the two groups. And if we do look at some of the differences in stent data, we have to acknowledge that the taxa stent here in red, which was the primary stent used in Freedom along with the cipher, is a stent which is obsolete. Here, here is a randomized trial in diabetics comparing outcomes, MACE, in taxa stents versus Everolimus saluti stents. And you have to admit that's a pretty impressive difference between you know, the, the modest outcomes in the taxus group and the pretty good outcomes in Everolimus. So that has made a substantial impact despite the fact that it's not bypassing all the disease. If we look at the stent thrombosis to five years, I'm not going to flog this horse for long, but the taxus stent has a cumulative uh, stent thrombosis rate of up to 10% at five years. That's huge. Um, stent thrombosis tends to have either a mortality of 50% or certainly the rest of them have a heart attack. So if 10% of your subjects are succumbing to that, that's a bad outcome. And um, the most modern stents have about a quarter of that rate over five years. So it's a, an important aspect to this. Um, MDT processes. I think, you know, MDTs and the heart team, it's all very fashionable and it's all very flavor of the month and that's good. And it's good that we should all meet and chat together and participate. But I, I have some concern about the MDT processes because the expanded heart team has really got quite expanded. And we've got all these people, geriatrician there, nephrologist there, neurologist, anesthesiologist, referring physician. Where's, where's the patient in all of this? You know, is this how we want our patient decisions to be made in the MDT boardroom? Who here actually knows the patient? Any of them? Quite possibly not. I go to lots of MDTs where I don't know anything about the patient and I'm not shy of an opinion. This is the guy that knows the patient. He's the one that will understand what it is that the patient is concerned about, what it is that motivates them to decide on their treatment. So the patient's perspective is often rather overlooked, in my view, in these discussions. Death and revascularization and MI are not necessarily the key things that an individual patient may be bothered by. Some of them are but some of them aren't. So let's see what the patient's perspective generally is on angioplasty. They think of it as a quick fix. You'll be able to get back out of hospital quickly, back to work, lower risk procedurally than surgery. They can go and look after their partner or their budgie or whatever it is, and that may motivate them to choose that 
treatment. Alternatively, they may take a view on repeat procedures. They may say, I hate hospitals so much, I never want to come into hospital again. I want something that's going to be a definitive long-term cure. I don't want to have this repeat procedure prospect hanging over me. Or, you know, my uncle Ted had a bypass 15 years ago and he's been fantastic ever since. So, you know, and these things influence people's choices. For, for bypass surgery, they may, they may look at it and think, well, I'll be debilitated. I have to take quite a lot of time off work. Maybe I'm self-employed. The risk of immediate death or stroke is quoted and is substantially higher than it is for an angioplasty procedure. And of course, pain is not, not inconsiderable in, in uh, coronary artery bypass grafting. It can be quite an unpleasant experience. And a lot of people don't much like the idea of having their chest opened. You know, surgeons <coughs> and even cardiologists are relatively used to the concept. But for the patient, it's a pretty horrid kind of idea. And they feel like they've been burgled inside. Um, but again, they may decide that what they want is a single episode. I never want to see you guys again, thanks very much. And uh, fix me and send me away and I, I don't have to worry about this again. Or friend and family experience. So all of those things are very important. This kind of thing, which is um, recently in the Lancet, which is a very complex analysis from Patrick Sorois of scoring systems and being able to present the numerical data from the syntax trial of your absolute risk of this and that and the other. You know, I don't know many patients who want to see this chart. They, they just want to chat to somebody they trust and try and work out what they should have and give their point of view. The interactions from the syntax trial are quite interesting. These are, these are sort of an attempt to get graphically what each aspect of procedural risk means in terms of where the balance lies between PCI and cabbage. So for example, you will not be surprised to see that those who are young, if you, if you look at age alone, the, the younger ones have a, a better, um, are better treated, if you like, as a global rule with bypass grafting, whereas when people get to be late octogenarian, you know, bypass grafting is not such a great treatment for them in comparison with PCI. So we have all of those, but <clears throat> diabetes, interestingly, in the syntax trial, as we've just discussed, seems to have no major relative impact. It's bad, but it's not particularly worse from the syntax trial comparison to the freedom trial um, with regard to PCI or cabbage. But the things that aren't in here are, th are things that might matter to the patient about how they choose their treatment. They, they need to look after their pet. Okay, so I would suggest that if they need to look after their pet, their pet is very important to them because it's all they've got, you know, PCI may well be a better option than bypass. If they're self-employed and they have to do manual work, they may well take the view that PCI is better for them than bypass surgery. If they're the main carer for their partner, they may well take the view that PCI is better than cabbage for them, way over and above the idea that well, you've got a 5% more chance of being alive in five years if you have bypass. So, you know, I'm not convinced that those are the things which motivate most of our patients. And then lastly, I make no apologies uh, here for showing this slide, which is the famous or infamous bubble slide from the syntax trial, which, which shows you that it's important to think about where you work and who your colleagues are and how good your unit is, et cetera, et cetera. So this was the relative cabbage versus PCI MACE rates at the, independent, at, the, at the different centers in the syntax trial. So essentially, if you worked here, your surgeons were fantastic and your PCI operators were rubbish. So, you know, naturally in that environment, you will be gravitating to have your diabetic patients having more surgery because your surgeons are very good and your angioplasty doctors aren't. If you work here, your surgeons aren't that hot, but your angioplasty doctors are pretty good. So more complex disease will head in that direction. People understand the relative strengths and weaknesses of their units. And if you work in this one, this unit, you're all brilliant. So it doesn't matter. They can have whatever treatment they like and they'll all live forever. <laughs> you will not be surprised to hear that this big burgundy blob is the Sussex Cardiac Centre. <laughs> so in conclusion, the question of optimal treatment for revascularization 
diabetics <laughs> is still open to debate. And each individual patient is important and has a different perspective and needs individually tailored discussions about what they should have. The MDT shouldn't just say to them, three vessel disease, diabetic, bypass. You know, it can't be done like that. It shouldn't be done like that. Patient preference, weighting their relative interests, the trade-offs, is very important still. Contemporary studies do have an impact on hard outcomes, and uh, local variables are, are still important. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave.